Previously on The Mister. Oh, I am so attracted to my cleaning lady. Ah! Perspective shift. Oh, there's no way the mister would ever look at me. I'm just the cleaning lady, gallivanting around my employer's home, wearing no pants. Perspective shift. I yearn to touch her with my penis. Last chapter ended with Maxim agreeing to visit his estates to increase staff morale, but not wanting to leave Alessia, the woman he's become so infatuated with that he has ceased all fuckboy activities and made Alessia into a muse which inspired multiple musical compositions. So, he's already developed an unhealthy obsession that we're supposed to hail as romantic. Uh, are we sure this isn't just Fifty Shades of Poldark? Huh. Now, Chapter 7 picks up with Maxim brooding along the countryside of one of his family estates, staring longingly at the ocean like the 18th century English romantic love interest he so yearns to be. He reminisces his old childhood days playing with his siblings being heroes and him being the villain. How apt, our unreliable narrator comments with a nostalgic smile. Maxim also tells us that his visit was a success and he's settling into his earldom role without providing any proof of such. Laissez-faire, hardcore partier, familial black sheep, DJ Pussy Thrasher tells us he's made a complete 180 on his ways and we're meant to accept that at face value. Once again, Maxim says he's gonna go do some business-related businessy business business only to immediately smash cut to him having done the thing. There's no more personal struggle adapting to the workflow thrust upon him. No conflict with any staff who just may not think Sir DJ Pussy Thrasher is capable of maintaining the high esteem of the family name. Nope. <laughs> Kit was so diddly damn competent at his job that Maxim can kick back and coast off of Kit's success for God knows how long. Okay, so not a complete 180, more like 135? But we all still shitting cupcakes and rainbows tonight, boys. Okay then. <laughs> Maxim squeezes in some Alessia pining at the tail end of his perspective section, lest we forget he yearns for her after all. Perspective shift. Alessia arrives at one of the only locations she's physically allowed to exist at. She's been missing Maxim's presence a heck of a lot and hasn't stopped thinking of him. She opens the door and notices there's no alarm. <gasps> Oh my golly gosh, he must be home early. Sure enough, she notices an abandoned duffel bag and a track of muddy footprints leading down the hallway. Um, what? How? To put this in perspective, the previous page, nay, the top of this very page, has Maxim brooding somewhere out in the countryside. Then he just busted out his portal gun and now he's back home. Erica, you f Ding dong. Really, a short paragraph of Maxim resolving to travel back to London in the wee hours would have been better than was essentially the equivalent of Pooh Bear physically traveling across the text of his own book. So anyway, Alessia removes her boots, which I guess she retrieved during one of her previous cleaning visits. Okay? Like, James made a notable point to have Alessia run out and forget her boots in the last chapter. I figured this was gonna lead to some Cinderella-esque moment down the line. I mean, you know, considering this is a modern day Cinderella story or so Lady Erica says. <laughs> Although, I wouldn't put it past this freak to secretly hoard the one boots to rule them all, getting high as f on the noxious corn chip smell as a way to cope with his Alessia withdrawals. <laughs> But I guess not. So yeah, Alessia changes into her cleaning uniform and gets to work. She steps into the living room and there he is, fast asleep on the couch. Stepping closer, she ogles his sleeping form. But before Alessia can decide if she should wake him, a sleep-talking Maxim holds his hand out toward her, then pulls the good old yank the girl on top of me maneuver. Mm. Nothing gets my skimmy jimmies going more than thinly veiled sexual harassment between employer and employee who are acquaintances at best. Oh yeah. 
Alessia is surprised for a moment, but steals her anxiety and wonders if this isn't what she wants and even dreams of. The exact kind of scenario she's previously masturbated to? She seizes the opportunity and leaves a shadow of a kiss against his hairy skin before she finally comes to her senses. And now, we're in for some real tonal whiplash here. First, she gently wakes him, getting more insistent when he doesn't immediately spring up. When he does come to, his groggy ass is all, Oh, the hell? Oh, oh shit, I'm sorry. Alessia then leaps up, ready to scurry off, because awake man's scarier than sleeping man. He grabs her hand to stop her, and she is legit triggered. But then she's okay and all compassionate once he's apologized for spooking her and tracking mud into the house. So she kneels down to take his muddy shoes off for him and then escorts his ass to bed, tucking him in for night night. She's gone from uncertainty and confusion to delight and wonder to compassion and assertiveness in the space of a few minutes. How is that a good thing? My neck just got wrecked from all that. I know what James was going for here, but whoa, those are some drastic mood swings that Alessia power through in the space of a few minutes. Perspective shift. So it turns out that this drastically dehydrated mother braved an incoming blizzard through an exhausting five hour drive. <laughs> Just so he wouldn't miss the chance to inevitably strike out with the cleaning lady he is obsessed with for a whole nother week. Simp. He falls asleep, only to jolt himself awake a generous text space later. It finally dawns on him, as he's lying there, that he jumped Alessia by making her jump him? He still feels bad and apologizes to her because of course she's still at the apartment. I mean... He woke up with her on top of him and in his embrace, so I don't know how he missed that, but okay, whatever, that's fine. Maxim peers through the large windows by Alessia to notice the big old blizzard snowstorm hitting full force. After inquiring how she usually gets home, by train, he checks online to see that trains have suspended all their services. Suspended? Her brow creases. Oh. She doesn't understand. <laughs> uh, those hyphens aren't entirely necessary there, my dude. It makes Alessia look like she's learning what words are for the first time, and that she's a little slow at the pickup. She may seem slow, but Maxim is mighty quick to offer her his place as shelter from the blizzard. And thank fuck she refuses within a hair's breadth of the offer being made. But he insists, not taking no for an answer on driving her home. She pales, not outright accepting, but not refusing either. Which, fine, how else was she gonna realistically get home in a blizzard? Walk it? Maxim rushes off to get dressed. That exchange was all awkward as hell, but I'm glad she's at least apprehensive about accepting her boss's uncomfortable assertiveness. Perspective shift. Alessia has some internal conflict with how her old country parents would react to her being alone in a car with a foreign man. Also, the mystery of why it took Alessia an extra week to make it to Magda's house as shown in the prologue is finally solved. She got lost. Cool. Well, her hitching a ride with Maxim makes more sense now. If she chose to walk home, she'd probably get lost again for a whole nother week. So there's that. Anyway, Alessia goes to play the piano while she waits for Maxim. Perspective shift. Maxim comes out, ogles her perfect piano playing, then her perfect figure. She's just so skinny and slim and slender and has a narrow waist but still has all those delicate all-womanly curves with soft swelling breasticles and the perfect pair of skin-tight jeans that show off all those skinny, slimmy, slender hips. <sighs> cool. Maxim sees that she doesn't wear socks and wonders if that's an Albanian thing. No, Maxim, that's just an unsanitary thing. Girl probably has foot funguses for days. He also notices she's wearing a little rosary necklace and immediately worries that she might be an underage schoolgirl. Like, wow, that is a direction to leap in. Woo! 
So, <laughs> he asks her how old she is. I'd have 23 years. Old enough. Good. Wait, so rosaries aren't exclusive to schoolgirls? You were telling me Catholic School Babes 9 lied to me? But seriously, doesn't this sound predatory as fuck, or is it just me? Compounded with the way he infantilizes her to the point of thinking she could be underaged? That is an oof from me, Chief. But thank God I can continue my low-key pursuits without fear of getting nutcapped by Pedo Bear. Good. Good. They go to the garage, and Maxim hastily tidies up a load of clutter in his Jaguar because he's so rich and privileged. He's never needed to learn how to clean. Tossing garbage in the bin is poor people work. Which, again, it's fine. It's fine. It's a part of his character. But Mama still lives to roast. So, they're in the car. He inputs her address into the navigation, revs the thing up, and the seatbelt alarm goes off. Alessia's surprised, because she doesn't wear seatbelts where she's from. <laughs> what the hell? Why is James painting Albania out to be like this third world backwater hole? Maxim just assumes people there don't wear socks? Alessia's never grew up all that tech-savvy, something I find very hard to believe in in a post-Soviet 2000s. Even today, anyone can acquire an older model smartphone for cheap. But here we have seatbelts being a thing that don't exist to her? Seatbelts. That's the hill we're gonna die on. <laughs> okay. Anyway, they converse during the car ride. Mac confirms for us that Alessia's got synesthesia, and that's pretty neato. He teaches her how to say that word as well, and his dick springs to life at the sight of her smile. That's nice. Maxim pulls up to Magda's house, is briefly threatened by tall 14-year-old Michael, thinking that's her boyfriend, but thank God that misunderstanding is swiftly averted, and they part ways. That closes out Chapter 7. Chapter 8 starts with Alessia coming down from the afterglow of the car ride. We also finally learn a little more about her. She's on the run from immigration, who paid a visit to the house earlier that morning, but a neighbor covered for them. However, Magda scored a green card marriage opportunity in Canada, where she and Michael are moving to in two weeks' time. So Alessia, with only 300 quid saved up, has to find her own place by then. She also cannot be deported back to Albania, no matter what. Alessia tries not to think much more about her past, just to drag out the suspense, I guess. Fine, whatever. Mm. Then she goes back to thinking about Maxim, recalling the not-so-distant memories of him educating her ignorant ass on synesthesia really gets her going, and um, more power to her. She wakes up the following morning with her next client in mind and starts her day with a nice shower. Perspective shift. We immediately jump to Maxim in the shower, jerking off to thoughts of Alessia. Again. God. With the way this guy goes from 0 to 100 over the girl, I'd almost mistake this for yet another not very good author insert fanfic novel. Or a stalker thriller. Aside from that, he just has a night out drinking with his two bros, and they all crash at Maxim's place. With Alessia scheduled to come clean in the next morning, Hmm, I wonder what could possibly happen next. Ugh. Perspective shift. Alessia arrives at Maxim's place. Two strange, nearly naked men and Maxim greet her. It is as awkward as you can possibly imagine. Perspective shift. It's less than a page long and only has the two bros approve Alessia's prettiness, question Christina's whereabouts, and shuffle off to put clothes on. Pointless. <laughs> Perspective shift. Alessia's tidying about. She delights in the absence of Mount Condoms in Maxim's wastebasket once again. Girl, you have got to stop monitoring Maxim's condom usage. It is weird. Maxim walks in and catches Alessia inhaling his stanky shirts. They talk some, and he teaches her a whole nother new word. Maxim reaches over her to get a sweater. His arm brushes her shoulder, and she freezes up. Tail between his legs, he leaves her to resume the laundry. Perspective shift. Maxim is conflicted on whether he should ask Alessia out. 
He finds her holding the laundry basket by the forbidden room door. Maxim reveals that it's just a dark room and he invites her in. Wow, that is anticlimactic. Mm. Perspective shift. It's barely half a page long and it has the two just stepping into the dark room with Maxim informing her that photography is a hobby he picked up from his father. Fucking pointless. Perspective shift. Maxim takes Alessia's picture, calls her stunning and beautiful, and kisses her on the mouth. She lightly traces her fingers over his lips. He embraces and kisses her again, slipping the tongue in for good measure. God, this is so creepy! Not only are they still barely acquaintances, which I've said multiple times already, there is zero sense of passion in the moment. I felt more chemistry between Emma Watson and Dan Stevens, and I was in a state of perpetual blood-curdling rage during that shitfest. Hell, Maxim clicked better with Heather and Letitia. Ugh, I just don't get it. How can someone write a book where I'm on chapter 8, the two main leads are almost always near each other, always always thinking and pining over one another, immediately after they meet, which was four chapters ago, mind you. Yet, there is no semblance of chemistry, romantic or otherwise. Like, I never thought I'd say this, but credit to Handbook for Mortals, man. At least that book has the decency to have its main pair sort of meet in the second chapter and hold out for five chapters, speedrunning the rivals, because they were never really enemies to begin with, two friends to maybe lovers trope before they ended up sucking face. God, I feel like such a damn pearl clutcher here. But I love romance. I love erotica. I can enjoy a good piece where two characters are drawn by passionate lust and just f So I'm trying to figure out what makes this so unsettling to me. And I think it's got something to do with the power imbalance between them. In my live read tweets, I cited them as being employer-employee, but upon dwelling on it now, it's a rather shallow take. I mean, it's a kind of dynamic that's pretty popular and for good reason. It can make for interesting and sexy storytelling. Then... <laughs> While I was drafting this very script, I suddenly recalled what I just noted earlier. But seriously, doesn't this sound predatory as fuck, or is it just me? Compounded with the way he infantilizes her to the point of thinking she could be underaged? This reads to me like a man unwittingly taking advantage of a young girl. I say unwittingly because Maxim doesn't come off as the predator type right now. Who's to say down the line? Sure, the dude's got mad self-esteem issues, and some of his interactions with women have certainly raised some brows, like this, and this, and um, that. <laughs> yeah, like, lowercase yikes. But he's nowhere near the monster Christian Grey is. Just a mighty creep. However, like I previously stated, the way Maxim goes from zero to a hard hundred for this little dandelion for no reason and with no preamble is pretty damn off-putting to me. Like, this kid comes off as so naive to the world. I can only imagine how positively marveled she'd have been the first time someone would whip out one of those multi-purpose sliders in front of her. Her reaction would have been like, oh! You can conjure fire so easily nowadays. Back home in Kukes, we only had access to the communal lighter once every three days. Heaven forbid it ever ran out of fuel. <laughs> I'm sure James is most likely going to jump through so many narrative hoops in an effort to make Alessia a hardened lady who's seen and experienced some real shit. Which, to be fair, would make Alessia a hell of a lot more developed than fresh out of the box sex spot Anastasia Steele. However, like, her delicate flower characterization has pretty much already been set. You can solidify a chocolate truffle as much as you want, it's still gonna have that gooey center. Then again, this could all be chalked up to James's bad writing. I mean, this dummy vehemently refuses to admit she accidentally wrote a story about terrifying abuse in Fifty Shades. Benefit of the doubt, I like to think she didn't intend to write something that could be interpreted in this manner. Nevertheless, though, I'm pretty nervous about this pairing going forward, for reasons I never expected! Yay! 
Anyway, back to this. So, these two are, thankfully, interrupted by two thugs at the door who are obviously not from immigration. Which is apparently called Border Force in the UK. The more you know. They try to force their way in, but Maxim's just so hench! He can hold them back while declaring they need a warrant to search the place. A neighbor peeks out to witness a spectacle, which scares the thugs off. Maxim goes to find Alessia, but she's not there! The chapter ends with her having cheesed it down the fire escape. Chapter 9 immediately picks up with Alessia as she flees down said fire escape, mid-panic because she recognizes the voice of one of the thugs. After a quick vomit session, she treks all the way back up the escape to confirm Maxim's safety, then rushes all the way back down again to make a beeline for home to check on Michael and Magda. Perspective Shift Barely a page and a half of Maxim panicking too, but then he surmises that Alessia will most likely go back home, so he sets off toward that destination. Perspective Shift Another page and a half of Alessia worrying while on a train. Perspective Shift Maxim races to one of the train stations en route to Alessia's house in order to intercept her, which he does. Perspective shift. Three paragraphs long, Alessia is surprised to see him and starts to cry. Perspective shift. Maxim embraces her, then the two of them race back to Magda's place together. And that clunky sense of emergency is just fucking dropped when Alessia finds no one is home. She then just puts the kettle on like it's now a casual home visit? Like they didn't just rush there in a tension-filled panic? And now it's dissipated like that? What? They attempt a round of 20 questions and Alessia reveals she's in England illegally as a victim of sex trafficking. Um... Yeah, that's some heavy shit there, James. Certainly curious to see how her trauma will be handled going forward, especially considering how Alessia is starting to ease into Maxim's advances. Hopefully it'll still be relatively consistent and not devolve to whenever it's just narratively convenient. Magda returns and fills the two in on the situation from her end. Turns out the thugs found Alessia through Michael's Facebook. Alessia looks at Maxim in horror. Michael has taken these selfies with me! The selfies? I ask. Yes, for the Facebook, Alessia says, frowning. I quickly mask my amused expression. Now doesn't quite seem like the appropriate time to find amusement in Starfire's English efforts here, my guy. The goons threatened Michael's safety, so Magda gave them Maxim's address. He suggests getting the police involved, but Alessia and Magda are adamantly against it. Magda and Alessia both speak at once. No police! They are emphatic. Are you sure? I can understand Alessia's reaction, but not Magda's. Perhaps she's here illegally too. No police, Magda says, banging her hand on the table, startling both Alessia and me. Okay, I say, raising my palm to placate her. I've never met people who don't trust the police. Oh, sweet Jesus in heaven. <laughs> As a member of the 99% in America, this is the most hilariously out of touch thing I have yet to read in this book. Must be nice to be so shrouded in your elite privilege, you absolute Tory. <laughs> anyway, Alessia is not safe and has to lay low for a while. Maxim wants her to go with him. Hmm, so that's the route we'll be taking here. He's gonna keep her safe, and be totally capable of being alone with her in isolation. For her safety, I'm sure. I feel like this is how Alessia fell into being sex trafficked in the first place. Misplaced trust in a potential friend or lover. But Maxim's different. Aren't they all? <laughs> Perspective shift. Alessia ponders the offer and inevitably accepts it. Maxim offhandedly deploys some bodyguards for Magda so she and Michael aren't slaughtered in the dead of night. What a considerate guy. Perspective shift. Our couple leave Magda's place for a big ass mansion in the West Country, where no one can hear Alessia scream. Am I doing the right thing? Yes, I am. But maybe not for the right reasons. End of chapter 9. Oh? 
Is... Is that a massive red flag I see out in the distance? Why, yes, I do think it is. Alessia is in a situation where she's in a foreign environment, fleeing from what can be assumed to be an abusive past. She's not in Maxim's apartment because she wants to be. She's there because she has to be. She's in desperate need of funds because there's currently nowhere else for her to go. Hell, now she's in a situation where she really has no other place to turn to. The fact that Maxim knows this and is still keen on pursuing her just enhances the creepiness. It also leaves no doubt in my mind that Maxim is full on taking advantage of the situation and her. So long, Maxim's likability. It was nice knowing you, even if it was for such a short time. Avita Zen, farewell, sayonara. Ugh, I will say, I am thankful that something seems to be happening, though. I have been getting rather bored by all this incessant pining. It's a lot harder to get material out of dull content than it is for stupid. Jesus. And I'm only a third the way through. Lord help me. My god. Ugh. Why, hello there. So nice of you to drop by. If you'll please become utterly entranced by this crudely drawn hip swiveling, I'd like to deliver my ending spiel. <clears throat> <clears throat> Thank you all for watching. If you like what you see, and how can you not look at these hips go? Please consider supporting me on my Patreon, where you can get one day early access to all upcoming videos, as well as the entire uncut audio of book reviews. You can hear me yap for almost double the amount of time! You can also vote for the next novel for me to suffer through, or enjoy. I'm at y'all's mercy after all. I can even draw sketches for you at child labor prizes! Oh! I just, I just. Kinda. If you're unable to support me on a subscription basis via Patreon, and I totally understand, I also have a Kofi page tip jar for your instant generosity needs. You do you, boo. No judgment. Finally, a like and subscribe still goes a long way. I'm eternally grateful for any and all support. You may now peel your eyes away from this sexy, sexy penguin body. Remember to stay hydrated, friends, and take care.